everyone, welcome to Love and Sounds Off. Today I am interviewing Gary McHugh. Um, now, full disclosure, uh, Gary is a cousin of mine. Well, my my mum's cousin, so I know of Gary. But how are you, Gary? I'm fine, and um, you know, there's there's no problem being cousins. I'm I'm glad we're related. Uh, I never I, I never I, said there was a problem. I hope, that wasn't, <laughs> I hope that wasn't implied. No, no, not at all. It's it's lovely. I mean, Ireland is a small place. We're all half related it anyway. It's a very small place. That's very true. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Gary, and what you do? Uh, well, what I do, my my current job, I work as I'm director and CEO of an organisation called Young Irish Filmmakers, and it's a very special organisation because it kind of it does exactly what it says on the tin. We work with young people all over Ireland and we help them to make films. Um, and it's 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 an organisation that's been around a while. I I wasn't here when it started. It's it's here over thirty years, and uh, my predecessor, the man who founded it. Uh, great guy called Mike Kelly. He's a man from Kilkenny and he was a youth worker and a f- he was massive interest in theatre and film. And so he had the brainwave of joining the two. So he joined, he said, let's start a youth club with cameras. And that was 30 years, well, 1991, 32 years ago. And we're still going. We're working in schools and youth clubs and um, anywhere that I'll have us all over Ireland. So. Great fun. Great fun. And if anybody wants actually to find um, the Young Irish Filmmakers website, it's yifm.com. Um, and I looked at the website. It's it's amazing, as you'll see throughout this interview. Um, so I'd like to start off with my usual question that I like to ask people because I'm into music. Um, so you were in a family of eight. Yes. So there, there was going to be a lot of musical influences thrown at you. So I, I'm, I'd like to ask, what kind of music did you listen to growing up? Well, I was lucky. My eldest brother, uh, Paul Rick, or as some people know him, Sam, um, he kind of took it upon himself nearly to educate me in the world of music, which was great. And this is going back to the years of vinyl. And um, so that was the only way to play music at the time or cassettes. Um, and we had one old record player that because I'm I'm that much younger than my the rest of my siblings, I'm the uh, mistake or miracle, whichever way you wish to look at it at the I'm, end I'm of the say miracle. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, so because I'm that that little bit younger, they had all gone off to college and brought the good record player with them. Uh, but there was one old record player left at home. And so every month or two, he'd come home from college and he'd give me five or six albums to say, listen to these. And uh, then I'd have those five albums for, you know, a month. So I listened to stuff a lot. Uh, But he'd give me a really good mix. I mean, I I grew up with a mixture of David Bowie, Talking Heads, Africa Africa Bombata, um, uh, Bundu Boys, uh, Cold Feet, um, or sorry, Little Feet, um, George Thurgood and the Destroyers, Squeeze, lots of 80s and 70s and 80s, New Wave and English stuff, Brit, Brit pop before it was Brit pop kind of thing, and yeah. punk and punk as well. So I had a really good mixture of stuff. Um, I was exceptionally lucky. Um, I always say I was a spoiled child in every manner. So I was spoiled for choice for music. And I think that's a great education. If you hear music from all over the world, I think it's a really good way of kind of opening your mind to going, oh, my God, there's these kind of rhythms. and Oh, my God, there's those kind of what instruments are they playing in that work part of the world? And, you know, American music was very different than British music at the time. So it was it was a great education. That's really interesting. And whoever I've talked to with older siblings and they've always said that it's sometimes the older siblings who would have um, a musical influence on them. Um, so you you um, you like music. It's it's clear to me that you like music. But I want to ask, do you play music? Do you play any instruments? Um, some might argue it's an instrument or not. I played the drums since I was about instrument, 16. Instrument, 
Big time. Yeah, th- thank you very much. The backbone of any rock and roll music. Um, yeah, the, I've been playing drums since I was about 16 and not not really professionally, more so as kind of a hobbyist and had aspirations. Um, you know, at one one or two or three points in my time, my life, I've wanted to, oh, maybe this is the band that might, you know, we might do something with it or go on the road or go make it or whatever. Never really happened, but I had a lot of fun playing music down through the years. Played with all kinds of bands, kind of pop music, rock music, cover bands. Um, trad was actually the most fun I've had, believe it or not, with a trad band. Um, it's almost like it's a little bit closer to jazz than than the rest of them because you can kind of chip away and you're you're a backing instrument rather than you know in like in rock music where you're the part of the foreground and the part of the whole front front of the sound, you know. That you know what, a couple of things there that you said, which I completely agree with. Agree with. Um, yes, drum drums are an instrument, big time, and um, they are very much a backbone to a song. Um, but like I think everybody will say drums is the backbone of percussion, but I feel that it's a big part of a song as well. Um, and I was looking at a music video, and I saw in it for Scatman. <laughs> Okay. So, so I have to ask, <laughs> how was that? Well, I thought this might come up. Um, yeah, so in the 90s, 1990s, I was living in London and I had studied film and or radio and television and I wanted to get into filmmaking. And so I ended up working in music videos through pure luck. Um, I was knocking lots of doors and I landed in a really good company that was doing a lot of really big uh, music video productions. So I got to meet a load of my kind of idols, some very famous people and some not so famous. And Scatman John at the time was not famous. Let's let's understand that. So um, my friend was producing Scatman John's video. We'd never heard of him. The world hadn't heard of him at the time. And she said to me, Gary, you play the drums, don't you? And I went, yeah. So said, well, look, we need somebody to stand in. We've got people singing and dancing and doing all that for the video but we need somebody who can actually look like they're playing the drums on the track. So she said, would you just put on this hat and jacket and, you know, outfit and play in front of the film? I said, yeah, no problem. How much am I getting paid? You know, jokingly, I got 50 quid, right? On top of my day's rate. And she said, look, don't worry. It's going to be released in like Holland and that could be it. Won't go anywhere. Um, and three weeks later, it was on 17 times daily on MTV Europe. So needless to say, I couldn't walk down my own home, hometown without somebody shouting, Scott, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was funny. I didn't play on the track uh, when it was recorded. I think that would have been a producer or, you know, a, a session musician. But I, I mimed to the drums in the Scat Man video. So. Even still, I, that, is, yeah. that is massive. Hey, listen, um, I'm the one who probably got the credit for it. So I wasn't going to say no. And I probably got a few free drinks out of it uh, down the local pub. So it was, yeah, yeah it was, look, it was, it was my little moment of fame. Yeah, well, t- three minutes for all that, it, it, it seems like it was worth it. Um, all, all the kids in my class are always singing Scatman. It's mad. Um, so I'll have to tell them that tomorrow. Um, but along with, the, you're, you're a musician, you play the drums. Um, you were also a filmmaker. So what films did you grow up with as well? Um, I suppose it's funny, you know, looking back, you kind of forget, OK, where did this all come from? Where did I get into film? And I, I suppose I always wanted to be I, I kind of three main passions in life. One was photography and, and, and videography, which it grew into. Another was music, which we've spoken about there. And the third one was acting. Um, so I mean, I can talk about the acting at another time, but filmmaking kind of grew out of being quite interested in creating images. I wasn't particularly a, a visual, like a, an artist that would paint or anything like that. And I'm not saying I'm creatively an artist, but I had a real obsession with taking photographs and putting different things over the lens and trying to warp images. And this is before Photoshop and this is before, you know, Instagram filters or, or you know, filters or, or, or anything like that. This was analog photography. Yeah. Where, you know, you would take, uh, get a roll 
24 shots. You would go get put it into your camera and you would take those 24 shots. So you had really had to think them out and plan them and go, okay, what am I going to take an image of? I've only got 24 to take and it's going to take me a week to get it processed. So at the time, that became a real passion of mine, taking interesting images and playing with the, the lenses and, and the color and stuff like that. And, and then out of that bore, you know, kind of love for television. And I, I was a massive a consumer of television being what, you know, because I was five years younger than the rest of my siblings, I got to watch what I wanted to watch for about five or six years in my late teens. So I was constantly watching telly and cartoons and, you know, all sorts of crap on the telly and I uh, just became kind of in love with that and music videos really appealed to me as well so that's where it all came out of and then I went to study radio and television I did a year actually in business <laughs> business college thinking I wanted to be a businessman and run a business and within a year I just realized no this is not for me this is all about accounts and boring economics and I just just it didn't click with me so I gave all that up and then I went to did um three years of post leaving Cert course in the Liberties in um Dublin and that was the really practical course and really loved it I got to do loads uh create lots of work um and then I just once it was done there it's my, my sister was living in London and I said right London's the place to be I'm gonna go and I took my work experience and my CVs and knocked on doors until somebody let me in and it took off from there then. That's, that's a really cool story. Um, and I like the fact that music videos um, sparked your kind of interest in filming. So you said there that you were knocking on people's doors and stuff. Um, so when was your first kind of job as a filmmaker or an actor? Right. OK, but the as anyone in the film industry will tell you, you don't walk in the door and say, hi, I'm the next Steven Spielberg. And they go, oh, brilliant, you're here. And here's the camera and here's the, the entire crew. Go direct them. You always start at the bottom. Um, and most, you know, most people do. Now, film has been democratized since and it's far cheaper to actually make content now than it ever was. So people are directing their own work and hopefully jumping a few loops or a few rungs in the ladder rather. So, but in my day, it was, you had to get in at the bottom rung, uh, whether you'd gone to college and studied film or not. And that was as a runner, a production runner or an office runner. I managed to get into a company called Propaganda <laughs> Films and they're, um, they were based in Soho in London. And essentially I was a runner. I was like literally running everywhere. Somebody hands you a tape and said, I need that down at the edit suite in, you know, this Lexington Street, go get it there. They're waiting on it. And you take your tape and you run down, you run back and go, right, what next? All right, I want 20 coffees uh, delivered to this place. You know, all this sort of stuff. So um, uh, we were lucky with propaganda. I was lucky with propaganda because I didn't know who they were. But anybody in the industry at the time would know um, there's a famous director called David Fincher. And that was his production company. Um, and he had a company in LA, a company in New York, and this was the one in London. And so they dealt with some really big names. So I just landed on my feet and worked hard and worked long hours and got paid really badly, but just soaked up everything I possibly could. And it just took, kind of took off from there. And then I went freelance and started working with other producers and stuff. So, but it was all about brass neck, you know, just making, you know, <laughs> inroads not taking no for an answer and working hard when you got there you know so you, you've definitely worked up um all the way through the ladder in your filming and acting and everything so a big part of your life now is uh, the young irish filmmakers company and um, so when did you get into that um well as I said, I was in the London, I was in London in the 90s and I came home at the end of the 90s, actually just before the millennium. And I was working in restaurants because I couldn't get work in film over here because nobody knew me. And 
then I moved home to Carlo um, to look after my mom at the time. And I was working actually in radio in because I went, OK, I need a creative um, career of some description. I can't get any work in film. So I ended up working in CKR at the time, uh, recording voiceovers and stuff like that for them. And that was great fun. Radio is a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't giving me a full time position. And young Irish filmmakers, I'd heard through, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend kind of thing. There was this crowd oh, down, really? in, down in Kilkenny that were making movies. And so I, you know, with this great CV that I thought I had, was like, well, I've worked as this, I've worked as that. Surely they'd be mad not to take me on. So I rang them up and said, look, I'd love to come down and chat, see if you've got any work for me. And I met Mike at the time. Mike Kelly was there and he was getting ready to produce a feature film. and. I was telling him, you know, I've worked with this producer, that producer, this director, this, you know, I was just, you know, I was being all gung ho and cocky and full of myself and telling him what I'd done and how great I am. That's how you get a job sometimes. That can well, happen. sometimes. Well, he was very nonplussed about this. And I was kind of going, who is this guy? Does he know what he's talking about at all? And then he went, well, what else do you do? You know, as if to say, oh, no, it's OK. I know you can do that. That's great. But what else do you do? And said, so, well, I play drums. And he started, oh. And I do a bit of acting. I'm in the Amateur Dramatic Society here in Carlo. Oh, right. OK, that's interesting. And yeah, and at the time I was running with a friend, we were running a drumming circle for young people. And I told him I'm running a drum, drumming circle for young people. And he went, OK. When can you start? <laughs> so I was like, what? So what it was what clicked with me then was that's that brilliant. what it wasn't all this, you know, professional work I had done. The professional work is great. That means you know how the industry works. But can you actually work with young people, which, which was more important ah. to him? And that was really, that was key. And I always remember that that day. I still recount it to people. I probably bored lots of people with it around here. But the I still remember that day when I realized, ah, that's what he wanted to know. Can I actually work with young people? Now, at the beginning, I won't say I was the best at working with young people because I still had my, you know, I was nearly like a, a Nazi dictator when I went on set and stuff because I was expecting professional standards and these were young people of you know best will in the world they're not going to be up to you know London professional standards so um but I slowly but surely kind of realized that he was right and it's it's, it's about developing the person and helping them find their creative juices and help them find their creative journey and their pathway and stuff like that so it's a more more about of a development piece um, even whether it's writing a script or if it's getting on with other people on set or if it's about, you know, what skills should they explore? Uh, so it's all about development. And so that's where I kind of it clicked. And that was in 2001 or two, I started working with them. Um, and then after that, I went off and I did, um, they only had funding for a year or two. So I, a couple of years with them and then I went off and I did corporate video for a year, about five or six years um, with uh, the likes of Intel and Dell and people like that. So I was doing really big kind of corporate organizations. And that was interesting, too. But when the recession hit, it took a couple of years. But in 2010, I became redundant. And then the first people I rang was young Irish filmmakers. And they said, give us a couple of months. We might have something for you. And so in a couple of months time, I rang them. And sure enough, they said, right, we can start you in this state. And I've been here 13 years, just gone, uh, two that's days ago. Amazing. Yeah. Just two days ago. Well, yeah. that's, that's an amazing story. Now, that's kind of a, that's a chapter for a biography, if you ever write one. Um, mm -hmm. So you're very good with children. Um, when, or young people um because you go from nine to I think 25 yeah in Irish filmmakers yeah. so what do you feel is important for children when they're young to why do you think that they should learn about filming then especially is there any reason why you might think that well I mean I think filmmaking is um it is an art form it's a creative art form and there's lots of arms to it um and one thing I, I say about youth work and, and kind of youth development fits really well in with filmmaking. And the reason is because with filmmaking, you need all types of people. 
Yes. You need you need the visual ones. You need the uh, creative kind of writers. You need um, someone who's got an artistic flair or painting flair that might be able to do the sets. You need the gregarious ones or the people who are not afraid to the exhibitionists who are not afraid to go in front of camera and be a comedian or be serious or be a good actor. And you need the, the gadgety ones or the, the technical ones to do all the technical stuff for the editing. So it takes a lot of different types of people to create a film. So you've got this group collaborating with all these different skills with one goal in mind to make this film. And it to me, that's a great way to work with any group of people, young or old. And in fact, this this week I've been working with a group of vulnerable adults who are less abled and might have kind of learning difficulties. But again, you can work with them and bring all their skills to the fore. And it's a, it's a lovely way to work with people. So to me, it I mean, we're, yeah, I mean, we still we still try and, you know, at the upper end of what we do, we try and get young people into college and help them in their career. Um, but even at the the beginning of their kind of engagement with film it's about creative expression it's about communication it's about teamwork and that, those are all valuable skills to anybody no matter what they end up doing i can definitely see what you mean by all the different people that you need um to make a film because it does take a lot of people um people i did a course up at dcu um in a thing called CGYI. And it was, the course was called Director's Cut. And um, I did it and we I had eight people on my team. It wasn't a big film or anything, but I had eight people on my team and I found it very interesting, the making of a film. So what I was thinking in my head, I, I was looking at the teachers and the teachers in CTYI, they're always very engaged and happy with what they're teaching about. Um, but they never really show what their favourite thing is. So I want to ask you, do you have a favourite thing about young Irish filmmakers at all? Um, what I love most, I mean, I've had a couple of different jobs while I'm here, 13 years, and now I'm the director and CEO, which is lovely. I'm at the the top if you want but I mean we're a very flat organization in the sense that we're we try and treat everybody equal in in terms of the staff and so but down through the years I think my most favorite thing is working with um working with groups of young people who really want to engage with filmmaking as a process um because sometimes you go out to a school and they might not be, you know, they're a bit nonplussed about it. They go, oh, okay, might do this, might do that. But when you've got like about a group of 10 or 12 young people and they're all interested, they're all like, okay, let's give this a go. Then you've got a great group of people. And, and this kind of grows for any age as well. If you've got a group of people who are actually engaged in doing something together and don't have the walls up and don't have the barriers up and they're like, right, I'll give it a go. Then you've got, recipe for a some great fun but b you're gonna have uh, a lot of learning going on and a lot of moments where you're going aha uh -huh, that's how they do it in the movies aha uh -huh, okay that's how it is and you'll have lots of people asking questions and i love when people are asking questions because otherwise you feel like you're just talking 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 but if you've got questions then it's a conversation so engagement. yeah yeah engagement um yeah, I love working with people and um, helping them learn about film because you, I don't like teaching. Uh, and that's one thing we kind of make the distinction here. We facilitate learning. We don't teach. And there is a difference. Uh, teaching is somebody at the top of a classroom writing stuff down and go, right, go away and study it. And facilitative learning is where it's kind of active and I'm going to give you a few. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because I think the best way most people learn is by doing and are engaging with a subject. So that's what we try and do at every stage. It's like, well, are you talking too much? And then, then they're not engaging enough, you know? So if you're talking for more than, you know, 15, 20% of the time, then you need to hand it over to them. And you do that by throwing out questions, throwing out exercises, 
getting them up off their feet, doing stuff, and then then they'll actively learn. You know, so that's what I love. That's very interesting. Um, and I think that's a great answer for that question. I because I never, I always think this kind of uh, an opinion question, and I was thinking maybe it's the sound aspect, but or the actual filming aspect. But you gave me a great answer there by saying about that. Um, for my last question, which is just me asking a question personally to you, um, I am a big fan of Artemis Fowl. Um, so I wanted to ask, what was it like meeting Ferdia Shaw, the actor of Artemis Fowl, if anybody doesn't know who he is? Well, let me tell you. No. No, he's a, he's a lovely chap. Ferdy is an absolute gentleman. And sure, I knew him before. He was even a glint in Artemis' eye. Um, we knew, uh, uh, obviously, we're based in Kilkenny and Ferdy uh, and his family live in Kilkenny. And so Ferdy would have been... part of Ireland. Oh, why, thank you. Um, the But Ferdy would have been coming here. He would have come to our summer camps and then he joined up in the after schools program, which runs every week. And so very clever chap very engaged a uh, really good actor and um so we didn't know he was going for this audition we found out about it afterwards and so for us it was just as much as a surprise as anybody else so we were delighted for him and congratulated him but again didn't treat him any differently and he didn't expect to be treated any differently which is i think the the, right. mar- the mark of a gentleman so I think he's he's got a great career ahead of him if he decides to um, to continue with it, and if not, he's had an amazing journey with Artemis Fowl, and he did a great job. You know, fair play to him. He's a, a lovely young man. So yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I've saw I've saw some of the behind the scenes, and he seems like a lovely guy. And um, I I saw some of like the stunts during it, and I thought it was amazing how they made Artemis Fowl. Um, Oh, it's if, an amazing. Anybody, if anybody hasn't watched it actually and um, it's on Disney plus it, and it's an amazing film and then the books by Owen Colfer who again an amazing author um very his stuff is very out there but mm. very very good um well I've asked you all my questions you've answered them perfectly and you give me a whole story now that I'll def that will definitely stay with me um but thank you so much Gary for joining me today. I've really enjoyed talking to you and um, you've been very interesting throughout the whole interview. So thank you so much. Logan, you're an absolute gent. Thanks a million. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Gary. See you now. Bye, bye.